Greetings and welcome to the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. My name is Peter Mandeville and I'm a senior research fellow at the center. Here at Georgetown, I lead the Berkeley Center's Geopolitics of Religious Soft Power Project, a multi-year research initiative enabled by generous support from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, dedicated to exploring and understanding the various ways that religion fits into the foreign policy and external relations of states and governments around the world. Today's program is part of this project, and we're grateful to you for joining us. Our panel today, which is co-sponsored by Georgetown University's Al-Walid bin Talal Center for Muslim Christian Understanding, will be exploring Islam in Bosnia after communism, the Saudi connection. With the collapse of Yugoslavia 30 years ago this summer and the resulting ethno-religious conflict in Bosnia, the international community turned its attention to a tragedy playing out in the Balkans. For Bosnia's Muslims, one of the most important sources of external support came in the form of humanitarian relief and assistance from Saudi Arabia. Alongside its charitable contributions, Saudi Arabia also promoted in Bosnia the austere form of Salafi Islam, commonly known as Wahhabism. 30 years after the war, how should we regard the legacy of these transnational religious influences? To what extent have they reshaped the religious landscape of Bosnia? Are younger Bosnians turning to Salafism today because of the Saudi connection or because of reasons closer to home? In this conversation, journalist and scholar Harun Karsic will be joined by Emily Grebel, a professor of history at Vanderbilt University, to, to discuss the new short documentary film, Islam in Bosnia after communism, the Saudi connection. This film, which was produced by our Geopolitics of Religious Soft Power Project here at the Berkeley Center, explores the question of Saudi Arabia's influence on Islam in Bosnia against the backdrop of Sarajevo's evolving religious life. In the interest of time, I'm not going to read our speakers' full and very impressive biographies in full, but rather, as our discussion gets started, I will place in the chat box a link to their online profiles, as well as a link to the uh, film, the, the short film that we'll be discussing today. I'll also include a link to the main landing page for the Geopolitics of Religious Soft Power Project, where you can learn more about the initiative and also access the wide range of articles, working papers, and video recordings of previous talks associated with the project. Of particular relevance to today's discussion, we're excited that later this year, Oxford University Press will be publishing an edited volume, Wahhabism and the World, Understanding Saudi Arabia's Global Impact on Islam, based on research commissioned and supported by our project. This book will represent the first comprehensive academic study of Saudi religious transnationalism. Before I hand things over to our speakers to get the discussion started, just a few brief words about logistics and our format today. I wanted to make sure that all of you are aware that we will be recording this session. This is primarily for the benefit of those who are not able to join us for the live session, but all of you who are registered uh, to, to attend will receive a link to this recording uh, when it becomes live shortly. After we hear from our speakers, we will have some time available for a more interactive discussion and for a Q&A uh, segment. You can pose questions to our speakers at any time uh, during our session today by using the Q&A function, which is a button you'll see on the main Zoom control panel. You can hit the Q&A button and type your question into uh, the resulting window. And after our speakers finish their presentations, I will be putting a selection of those questions to them. So now, without further ado, let me hand things over to Harun Karsic to start the discussion and to tell us a little bit about the background to this film that we collaborated with him on. Harun, welcome. Thanks for joining us. And over to you. Hello, everybody. Well, it's a pleasure to be here um, and to join you today. Um, so um, I, I initially started researching, again, an interest in foreign Islamic influences in Bosnia back in 2005 and 2006, when I was studying law at Sarajevo's uh, law school. And so after, I, when I completed my law degree, I went to uh, pursue my master's degree in, in Italy at the University of Bologna. That's where actually I wrote my master's thesis uh, on Islamic revival in Bosnia and on the foreign factors that impacted Bosnia's Islamic revival, uh, specifically Saudi, Turkish, and Iranian influence. Uh, and I've been covering this topic uh, for the, uh, uh, I still continue to follow it, follow it quite closely now as a journalist, I've been working for obviously for the past um, 10 years. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's impossible to understand 
Islam in, in the Balkans, in Bosnia specifically, without looking back into the, the country's uh, more recent history. So as we know, Bosnia was a part of communist Yugoslavia since 1946. And this communist period really impacted uh, the everyday lives of, um, of uh, Muslims, uh, the way Islam is practiced, the way uh, is, it is manifested publicly. Um, in the sense that this was a very repressive, the Yugoslav communist regime was very, very repressive towards religion. Um, uh, in 1946, as soon as they came to power, they abolished Islamic Sharia courts. Then in 1950, they banned the niqab, which was a common practice among the urban Muslim population. Uh, then in 1952, they ordered all, all Islamic madrasa sco schools to be shut down. Um, there were 40 in Bosnia, and only one was left functioning, the Gazi Husarbeg Madrasa in Sarajevo. Uh, they expropriated, they nationalized and expropriated uh, property belonging to uh, Awqaf, Islamic endowments, which so in, essentially they stripped Mo Bosnian Muslims and the official Islamic community of its economic power. Uh, and there was a lot of, a great deal of cultural and uh, national uh, suppression. So Bosnian Muslims could not identify themselves as Bosniaks, but in, in, the, in the ethnic sense, but simply as Muslims or, uh, or as uh, undeclared, you know. Um, uh, so this really had had a, had a huge psychological impact on, on Bosnia's Muslims. Uh, so there was a turning point. Turning point happened in 1989, 1990, when communism collapsed. So that's when we saw the first signs of Bosnia's uh, mild Islamic revival. So we saw people in the 1990, 1991, um, you know, using uh, Islamic uh, greetings uh, among each other, you know, uh, publicly publicly ex expressing their faith. This was, so we, we had the first multi-party elections in Yugoslavia back in 1991. So there was a, a palpable sense of, of more freedoms, more religious freedoms in the Bosnian and in the Yugoslav public sphere. This was the same thing that happened in, in other parts of Eastern Europe. We saw a, a religious revival in Serbia, in Poland, uh, in Bulgaria, in Romania, later on in Russia as well. However, um, something else happened in, in Bosnia that was the war, the 1992 war, which was essentially a, a Serbian led aggression against the Bosniak Muslims and the genocide of Bosnian Muslims. And this really impacted the way uh, Bosnian Muslims understand and uh, understood and practiced their faith. Uh, Bosnian Muslims realized during the war that they were targeted uh, simply because of their Islamic names, even though most of them were not even practicing Muslims. Uh, uh, consuming alcohol or even eating pork was quite common among, uh, qu among a significant number of Bosnian Muslims and still continues to be today. Many Bosnian Muslims here uh, still continue to consume uh, alcohol. Um, uh, so, so the war had a real a drastic impact on the reawakening of Bosnian Muslim masses. Uh, so this, this, was, this was one major factor that, that led people to rethink their relationship towards their faith, towards Islam. And of course, the, the, back then, the, Bosnian, uh, the internationally recognized Bosnian government uh, tried to sought help, diplomatic and military help from, uh, from Western countries as it was under attack by neighboring Serbia, Croatia, and their proxy forces. However, it didn't receive the expected help uh, it was hoping to get from Western states. Uh, Western states tended to treat all sides as equally guilty in this conflict. In fact, they slapped a UN, the UN slapped an arms embargo uh, on Bosnia during the war. So the Bosnian uh, Muslim-led government uh, decided to go along its Islamic lines and try to seek help from Muslim majority countries to get what was necessary to keep the country running uh, at a time of war and genocide. So they they essentially toured the Middle East, starting from uh, Egypt, uh, Lebanon, Iraq, uh, um, Libya, the Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Turkey, all the way to Malaysia, Indonesia, Pakistan, uh, asking for um, money, asking for weapons, asking for food, asking for diplomatic support in the sense of asking more countries to recognize them. And um, they didn't really get the expected response they wanted. Some countries such as uh, Iraq under Saddam Hussein had very close ties with Serbia, with Belgrade. Uh, Muammar Gaddafi uh, did not provide Bosnia the, the help they expected because he kept very close ties with Serbia and with, Bel with Belgrade. However, Saudi Arabia answered the call, Iran answered the call, and quite shyly, Turkey uh, initially uh, answered the call, but we'll get back to that. Um, so, so, um, so when, so when the Saudis initially started sending their uh, humanitarian aid and medical aid to, to Bosnia, uh, they, also, they also funneled quite a bit of uh, money to help the Bosnian government buy weapons and uh, defend itself during the war. 
um, uh, and uh, quite early on, I came across, well, in fact, when I was doing my research uh, recently <laughs> at the King Fahad Mosque, uh, King Fahad Cultural Center in Sarajevo, I came across booklets published by the Saudi High Committee for, um, for, uh, for Saudi High Committee, uh, publishing uh, booklets about the basics of Islam uh, back in 1992 in hundreds, uh, in hundreds of thousands of copies. And they continued this, the same practice in 1993 during the war, 1994, 1995. So I asked myself, myself uh, why would the Saudi government want to publish books on Islam uh, and distribute it to a population that was to a country that was in the, that was trying to fighting for its mere survival to a population that was starving uh, during war. So then I realized that uh, among other um, this, this Saudi help that was provided to the Bosnian government had certain strings attached. They clearly wanted to help the Bosnian government government, but they also realized that the Bosnian population, having lived under a fifty year uh, communist rule, was quite uh, had didn't really have the the proper and even the basic understandings of Islam, and this was a fertile ground for the Saudis to dis disseminate their Wahhabi Salafi interpretations of Islam. Um, so, and then at the same time, the Iranians who also helped us send quite a bit of uh, weapons to the Bosnian government, uh, they started also <laughs> translating and, and disseminating their own sh books on Shia interpretations of Islam. I came across these copies uh, books published, uh, translated from Persian to Bosnian in 1993 and distributed to the Bosnian popula Muslim population in, in uh, they, do this, they do this, had these little food packages where they would do the stuff, uh, you, know, or, you know, cooking oil, flour, rice, you know, uh, fish, you know, canned fish, and of course, a couple of books on, on, uh, on Islam. Uh, so, well, we don't know how many people read these books. We know that some of them uh, would use these books, especially during the harsh Bosnian winters to heat up the stove and, you know, to keep warm. Some of them perhaps read the books. I don't know what they did with it. But uh, so anyways, the, the idea was there. The Iranians were trying to disseminate Iran, uh, Shia interpretations of Islam. The Saudis were in, interested in disseminating uh, Salafi interpretations of Islam. Turkey initially was quite, it was very shy. I came across um, statements from high-ranking Turkish government officials saying that we will not help. Uh, yeah, we have similarities with the Bosnian Muslims, but we will not help them directly. Uh, because we want to stay within the framework of NATO. If, if NATO decides to, to, to help, we will, will, will follow up, we'll, we, will, we will join the alliance. If not, we won't do anything, we won't unilaterally do anything by ourselves. Because back then, Turkey was, was ruled by, uh, it was a, I believe it was a leftist government, and the military was staunchly secular. So, of course, they weren't very interested uh, in helping uh, Bosnian Muslims. They were interested in 1974 in, in, in helping Cypriot Turks. Uh, or uh, in 1989, in opening the Turkish borders to accept Bulgarian Turks who were expelled by Bulgarian dictator Todor Zhivkov. But Bosnian Muslims were, of course, uh, they are Slavic Muslims, they're not Turks, they speak a different language. So the Turkish government back then was not too interested in helping. Uh, they did accept a small number of Bosnian refugees, I, I believe it was up, up to 25, 30,000. And most of these re refugees today were, I, I, in fact, I met a, a person recently who had lived in Turkey. Uh, still complains about the horrible living conditions they had in Istanbul during the war. Uh, Turkey is no welfare state, uh, so it didn't really have the money or the resources to help its Bosnian Muslim refugees. Uh, unlike uh, Scandinavian countries, uh, where most Bosnian Muslims actually fled, they fled to uh, Norway, Sweden, Denmark. Uh, some of them ended up in Austria and Germany, and most of them, actually, all, a vast majority of them continued living the, in these countries because, because living conditions were so good. Uh, many of them did not want, decided not to return back to Bosnia. Um, so this is going back to the Salafi, uh, to the Saudi uh, channeling of its interpretations uh, of Islam. So there were at least uh, three different channels. So it was the Saudi state uh, channeling of Salafi ideas through the Saudi High Commission for, uh, for uh, helping Bosnia. Then there were also, there were independent Islamic uh, humanitarian organizations and there were Salafi-oriented uh, uh, Arab uh, fighters. Uh, so we already mentioned the Saudi uh, state, uh, state funded, uh, the Saudi High Commission, which was uh, crucial in channeling um, Salafi interpretations of Islam uh, through publishing books, but also through organizing certain, uh, for example, Qur Quran reading courses for the for Bosnian uh, orphans, for um, you know, for the thousands of internally displaced families. But they also not only they didn't only provide you know Islamic literature. They also helped in the 
in in the sense that they provided food and medicine they they uh, opened you know temporary schools during the war they uh, they provided tents and heating the stuff that, that was really essential during the war because not hardly anybody else was helping in fact at one time the saudis helped provided, provided much more humanitarian aid than uh, western uh, humanitarian organizations so it's quite uh, so i do understand why uh, bosnians back then had quite a positive opinion uh, of of saudi arabia um, and then there were these non-governmental Islamic humanitarian organizations, uh, you know, such as the, the Society for the Revival of Islamic Heritage, the uh, World Assembly of Muslim Youth, Al Furqan, uh, Mecca Humanitarian Organization, the Third World Relief Agency. Some of them were close to the government, some of them were not. Uh, so they also provided funds for uh, the reconstruction of uh, mosques, for you know, um, for uh, you know, helping uh, the families of you know who had. Uh, family members killed in, in war, providing food and medicine, uh, tents and whatever else was necessary during uh, a war. Um, and then the third category, uh, the third channel for the, for the dissemination of Salafi ideas during the war were uh, Arab fighters. Now, they mostly came uh, after the war in Afghanistan ended. Most of these foreign fighters remained along the Afghani-Pakistani border. And then when the Pakistani government expelled them in 1991, 1992, uh, they, um, this, well, they saw Bosnia as a new uh, battle, battleground where they could continue, continue their activities. So they um, came to Bosnia and they were um, all quite battle hardened. Um, the Bosnian government made it quite clear at the beginning that they did not need additional fighters, that they had enough, enough fighters of their own, but they, what they needed was weapons and ammunition. However, at that point, it was quite difficult to expel them. So, so the Bosnian government, in order to keep them under control, because they were quite, some of them were quite troublesome, they integrated these people into their own ranks. Uh, so the unit was called the Al Mujahideen uh, unit, and this unit became quite notorious for uh, the dissemination of uh, uh, of hardline uh, Salafi ideas among fellow Bosnian Muslim fighters. So this was, in fact, they were crucial, and today they are mostly associated with the dissemination. Uh, of, of uh, Salafi ideas uh, in Bosnia. So, um, so this was the wartime period. After the war, uh, the, same, uh, the same organizations that functioned in Bosnia during the war continued their activities in post-war Bosnia in the sense that they, they, they focused their attention on rebuilding the country. The country was completely dev devastated. Um, just to give an example, the Serb army in Bosnia and the Croatian armed forces they destroyed 614 mosques during the war in Bosnia. And the Bosnian Muslim population, if you bear in mind, it was expelled from other, from Eastern and Northern Bosnia uh, and mostly concentrated in, in the central parts of Bosnia. So uh, now you had the, the biggest ethnic group, Bosnian Muslims living in a very small uh, um, area, part of the country. So uh, money was needed to construct new mosques a new Islamic schools, but also to renovate those, those these 614 mosques that were destroyed during the war, as, uh, along with hundreds of others of other uh, Islamic cultural heritage sites, such as um, you know, say, uh, uh, shrine, Sufi shrines, uh, tombs, uh, Sufi lodges, and so on and so forth. So these activities continued after the war. The Saudi High Commission continue, continued um, financing the construction of or the renovation and reconstruction of uh, destroyed mosques. The uh, reconstruction of madrasas, which were uh, shut down by the communist government, but which uh, which had to be which one, the Bosnian government wanted to reopen, and also there was a need for a new Islamic educational fa faculty. So the Saudis uh, helped uh, construct the buildings and open up the Saudi uh, the Islamic uh, educational faculty in Zenica and the Islamic educational faculty uh, in the northern Bosnian north northwestern Bosnian town of Bihać. Um, so the Bosnian government find uh, it was it was quite uh, it was quite I mean it still is quite uh, poor and back then after the war it had it didn't have the, the resources of, of its own to renovate and reconstruct um, buildings that were destroyed during the war and that were shut down during communism. So it found it saw the Saudis as a very useful um, ATM machine uh, to to get money and help help uh, well uh, help it help itself you know rebuild these. Um, these uh, these objects clearly Western Europe Western European countries were not very interested in helping Bosnia re rebuild its mosques or its or madrasas so the Saudis uh, jumped in um, so after the war the Saudis also but not only Saudis other Arab countries such as uh, Egypt the Emirates Kuwait Jordan Malaysia Pakistan they started providing uh, scholarships for Bosnian Muslims to study abroad 
And when you look at this from a broader perspective, it wasn't they didn't only aim for Bosnia because this is Bosnia. This was they, this was their policy uh, generally towards the Balkan Muslims, towards Central Asia, towards the Caucasus. So these were countries that had lived under a very long communist regime. Uh, they lacked the necessary knowledge, the necessary Islamic knowledge. So the, these countries saw an opportunity for themselves, a fertile ground to educate the youth coming from former ex-communist countries, countries and, and eventually gain um, an influence over the, over the short term. So, um, so the Saudis, the Iranians and the Turks provided scholarships to students from Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, all former Soviet countries, all, as well as uh, countries from the Caucasus, Azerbaijan, Muslims from Armenia, uh, and uh, you know Georgia, uh, Georgia and uh, Chechnya and Dagestan, but also from, from the Balkans, from Bulgaria, Romania, Serbia, Croatia, Montenegro, Bosnia, and Albania. So this was their common approach towards former communist countries. Um, so we don't. Uh, when I asked the Saudi embassy, uh, it was last year, exactly how many students had received a scholarship from the Saudi government. They told me that, that they don't have the exact statistics. Uh, certain scholarships were provided by the Saudi government. Others were provided by private donors, you know, rich uh, Saudi businessmen who had decided by themselves to fund certain Bosnian students or Balkan students. And, all, and also there were non-governmental Islamic organizations in the, from the Gulf that had, you know, similar activities. Nobody really has a comprehensive, uh, you know, sheet list of, of all the scholarships that were provided um, to, to, to Bosnian and Balkan students. But it is estimated by former students who had studied in Saudi Arabia, I believe it was <coughs> up to today, there at least at least 200 students had been educated um, in Saudi Arabia. Now, does this translate to, to the fact that all of them had accepted Salafi interpretations of Islam? And no, um, I in fact came across quite a number of Bosnian students who had studied in Saudi Arabia, but who had not um, accepted Saudi interpretations or uh, Salafi interpretations of Islam or who were not converted into uh, Salafi, uh, Salafism, um, uh, but also after the after the war, um, so along along with state uh, state channeled activities, uh, Salafi fighters, uh, scholarships, these same non governmental organizations that were active in Bosnia started. Um, they started. Uh, they helped to create local Bosnian led uh, Islamic organizations. One of the most popular was the Active Islamic Youth. Uh, which functioned in Bosnia for a period uh, for the in the, between 1997 and 2001, and these and similar organizations were instrumental in organizing, you know, summer schools, Quran courses, lectures uh, that aimed to spread to disseminate uh, Salafi uh, interpretations of Islam among the the uh, Bosnian Muslim uh, youth. So now um, I must say that the Bosnian government didn't, but the Bosnian public didn't didn't wholeheartedly accept. Uh, Salafi, Salafism as such. Um, there were reactions from the Islamic community in Bosnia. When I say the Islamic community, I refer to the official Islamic community uh, that exists in Bosnia. This is comparable to the Dianet in Turkey, except that the Dianet is, of course, a state-funded uh, organization, while the Islamic community in Bosnia was, or, was established by the Austro-Hungarians, and it is uh, self-financed and very autonomous. So uh, members of the Islamic community by themselves will pay a, a, an annual fee about, for about 30 euros um, to be members. And from this, the, the, the mosques are you know, uh, maintained, the, the imams or the religious leaders are paid and so on and so forth. So they do receive hardly any, uh, almost no funds from, from the Bosnian state. Um, so there were reactions. I came, across, I came across reactions from the Islamic community as early as in December 1992. So during the war, the Islamic community in this, in this official newspaper, Preparod, there were reactions towards what they referred to as new interpretations of Islam. And um, so they talked, they talked about, uh, it was a really, uh, it, was, it was a thinly veiled criticism of Saudi Arabia. And in fact, I met, I met some of the authors of these texts and I asked them, why didn't you criticize Saudi Arabia more openly in, in your articles back in 1992, 1993? And they said, you know, we couldn't, we depended so much on Saudi financial help that we simply couldn't criticize them that openly, but we, we realized that they were creating chaos among Bosnian Muslims. We were, uh, because back then the country was under attack, there was a war, there was, there was poverty, there was no food. And then you, yet, yet you had these uh, missionaries who were um, 
and Islamic foreign fighters who were disseminating new interpre interpretations of Islam to a population that had no knowledge of Islam whatsoever. And it create a lot, created a lot of confusion. And these reactions from the Islamic community continued in 1903, 1904, 1905, uh, and later even after the war, culminating perhaps in 2006. There was a 2005, 2006, there were even physical clashes between uh, Salafi and traditional Abbasian Muslims in a number of mosques. So most of these clashes between uh, Salafi Muslims and uh, traditional Bosnian Muslims, as we refer to, us, to ourselves, were about some of the basics of Islam. For example, whether it is acceptable to use this, the tasbih in your prayer or not. Uh, this is something which is very common among us in the Balkans, in Central Asia, and throughout most of the Muslim world. To the average Salafi, this is a bidah. This is a novelty which is forbidden in Islam, essentially, and uh, some they have they would go as far as to excommunicate you for using this in your prayer. Um, so uh, these were some of the some of the main points of contention between uh, Salafi interpretations uh, of Islam uh, and local Bosnian Muslims. Which, of course, of course, we didn't have. There were no such clashes between Bosnian Muslims uh, and Turks because the Turks pretty much promoted an interpretation of Islam which was very similar uh, uh, to what Bosnian Muslims practice. Uh, so I should be wrapping this up. <laughs> I was just told to do so. We'll continue with our Q&A session uh, soon. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Harun. Um, so much to explore, so many questions yeah. to ask and in, in, in everything that you've got covered. Um, before we turn to our next speaker, I just want to remind our audience that you can um, pose questions to our speakers at any time by using the Q&A function on your Zoom control panel. We already have uh, several questions coming in. Um, so we'll turn now to Professor Emily Grebel of Vanderbilt uh, University. Emily, I know you have a book coming out later this year with Oxford University Press. Uh, on Muslims and the making of modern Europe. Um, and uh, I, um, if, if we don't hear from you about some of the arguments that you put forward in that book, I'm definitely going to want to ask you about the, the book a bit uh, during our discussion period. But let me hand over now to you for your thoughts on these issues and topics. Thank you so much, Peter. And thank you, Harun, for getting us started in this conversation. Um, I'm going to keep my comments fairly short so that we can we make sure we have time for um, the audience to to speak uh, to hear from from all of us and to hear from you guys. Um, so as Peter said, I was brought here today as a historian who specializes in the history um, of Balkan cultures and societies, including uh, Muslim cultures in Bosnia Herzegovina. Uh, so my perspective on this topic is a little different from policymakers or politicians, anthropologists, social social scientists, um, because I look at this story and I think this is not entirely new. Um, and how can this sort of a broader historical context help us make, make sense of this? Um, the type of scripturalist Islam um, that Saudi Salafism represents um, was broached in different ways and by small communities of scholars in Bosnia in the early 20th century. Um, it was one of many currents or ways of sort of thinking about Islam and, and practicing Islam. Um, likewise, foreign efforts to infiltrate um, Bosnian Muslim communities and shape Islamic practice mm -hmm. is not entirely new. Um, from the Ottoman era to the Habsburg era into the early 20th century, um, there were foreign groups, there were external non-Muslim groups that tried to shape Islam, there were external is um, Islamic groups and activists um, from Egypt and Saudi Arabia and Turkey in the 20s and 30s and 40s um, that also sought to sort of infiltrate and define what Islam would look like in Bosnia. Um, and finally, efforts to um, remove marginalize and suppress Muslims in Southeastern Europe is not new. Um, the war in the 1990s was a particularly brutal example of this, um, but there had been expulsions and massacres um, and sort of rampant Islamophobia. Um, we didn't call it that in the 19th century, but it existed. Um, and I think as we kind of think about these complex historical moments and ideas, um, they we, we can sort of start to make different sense and new sense of um, what Saudi influence in Bosnia Herzegovina has meant. Um, and one of the things I loved about this documentary was how carefully and nuanced Harun presented sort of the complex historical moment from sort of the first sort of 
period of the end of socialism and the religious freedom that it brought, but also the kind of questioning that that would then bring, right? What kind of Islam do people want to practice? What does their relationship with faith mean? What role will Islam play in culture and society after this sort of extended period of repression, but a period that had been preceded by a truly vibrant and dynamic Islamic life in, in the region that took lots of different forms. Um, we also then see sort of through the film, um, this sense of hope that the Saudis uh, presented, right? And Harun was just speaking about this hope and how it came in so many different forms, right? The political, economic, and also I wanna say environmental crises since the end of the war um, in Bosnia, there's been terrible flooding, there's been earthquakes, uh, there's a massive debt. People are struggling with microloans. Um, the economy sort of collapsed. Um, it was part, partly both because of a post-socialist restructuring and also because of a post-war devastation um, and rehabilitation. Um, you know, public spaces were run down. Unemployment has been rampant. Um, and factories shut down. Oftentimes, foreigners would purchase a factory and then sort of end longstanding sort of pensions or social benefits. Um, so you have and you see in the film these kind of overlapping and multiple crises that led Muslims in Bosnia Herzegovina to search for different ways of meaning, security, resources, support, kind of reconstituting a culture and, and a society. And I think what we see in this film is that the Saudis offered one means of doing that. Um, they they came, as Harun was saying, not just what, with kind of a Salafist mission, but with a truly kind of comprehensive missionary approach of supporting infrastructure, supporting um, social welfare. The I, I knew someone in 2004 who got one of these Saudi grants to study in America, and he came to the U.S. to study mechanical engineering with a fully funded package by, I don't know if it was the official government or um, or a, a private business owner, but you, these kinds of stories be offered hope, right? and they offered an opportunity um, for people to see kind of a new post-war, post-socialist future. Um, <clears throat> The other thing I wanted to say here was, and I and we see this also both through Harun's comments and the film, uh, that the Saudis and the Salafist sort of path was was really one of many different paths of, yeah. of as people have been searching for meaning. We also see um, neo Sufism and sort of the mystical path of Islam, where many Bosnian um, uh, Muslims and Herzegovinian Muslims. <laughs> Um, have redefined their re relationship to Islam through local and regional culture of a personal mystical relationship um, with Allah, um, and often revived repressed Sufi practices um, that were not just repressed in the communist period, but actually had been repressed earlier in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, we also see Muslims turning to nationalism, like other peoples across Eastern Europe, Right. Um, and reinventing a cultural community in which sort of Islamic symbolisms and cultures and histories are integrated into a nationalist idea of sort of staking claims to land and sort of making a commitment to a particular space. And this is very similar to the ways that nationalism has operated among Croats and Serbs, uh, Macedonians, Montenegrins. It's a it's a common practice. Um, and, and then finally, um, I wanted to also note sort of this comment, which I think was really interesting, um, which was the sort of question of corruption um, that the film brings out and that Harun in, uh, described. And, and this notion of sort of what is a formal Islamic religious community? What does it represent? And these ideas that um, for many people, you know, the official Islamic religious community seems like it's missing something or it seems like it's not quite representing their own interests and and within that then there's a search for well if not that then what right and and within that the saudis are able to really offer a different kind of path you know, sometimes to the detriment sometimes sort of in a propagandistic way right because the, these these languages of corruption can become sort of um, 
dominant in ways that are not necessarily grounded in reality. Uh, but they they do exist and they also extend backwards to this notion idea of sort of who gets to represent Muslims in Bosnia Herzegovina and what will that relationship be between those formal bodies of representation, people's faith and um, sort of public culture, right? state culture as one community within a multi-confessional um, society. So I think actually, Peter, I'm gonna leave it there for now because I think it that will give us the at least the 20 minutes of, um, of Q&A. Um, I have a lot more I can say about this, both in the historical perspective and also in the contemporary, uh, but I'd, I'd love to, I, I feel like these, these webinars in the era of Zoom are so much more fun when, when, when people who are participating can, can ask questions. Absolutely great. Thank you so much, Emily. In fact, you've left us with 25 minutes that, that we can use for um, discussion and Q&A. Um, I, I actually wanted to kick off with um, a, a question for each of you before we, we turn to the handful or so of questions that have come in. And again, remind our audience that the, uh, the uh, Q&A chat box is, is open. So please do go ahead and type in those questions. Um, Harun, let me start with you. You you mentioned both in the in the the wonderful documentary film you made and in your presentation that there is a story to be told in the early '90s of uh, Saudi Iranian and to a lesser extent Turkish religious influence entering Bosnia, um, but in different forms and with different kinds of effects. I, I wonder if we could invite you to kind of fast forward 30 years to today and reflect on the legacy of those different uh, vectors of transnational religious in influence. You know, do, you know, how would you compare what ongoing, if it exists, Iranian religious influence looks like in Bosnia? My sense is that the Turkish influence has increased substantially yeah, and, and is now very significant. So it'd be great to hear from you about the com comparison between those. And, and Emily, um, I did want to ask you about your forthcoming book, actually, because you, you really, I, I think, um, confront a kind of conventional wisdom um, that many operate with around the idea that Muslims and Islam is somehow something foreign to Europe and make the very interesting argument that if we kind of shift the geographic locus of our focus within Europe a little more to the south and to the east, we actually reveal a history in which Muslims are central to the construction of European nationalism to the making of Europe itself. Um, I would kind of love to hear from you in terms of where uh, sort of Bosnian Islam fits into the story that you're telling here and where and how these transnational influences that we're focusing on fit into um, that, that, that story. So Harun, could we start with you? Yeah, well, that, that was an uh, excellent observation. Yeah, I myself noticed that if you look back at these foreign factors back in the 1990s, we had a uh, huge Saudi interest and influence in Bosnia, much less, m lesser Iranian and much, much less, lesser Turkish influence. However, the turning point was 9-11, the September 11th attacks on the United States. After that, the US Treasury uh, began scrutinizing all financial transactions from the Middle East around the world, and they paid particular attention to these developing countries such as the Balkans, Central Asia, and so on and so forth, which had a significant Muslim population. So we saw a decrease in, in funding coming from the Middle East and Saudi Arabia towards the Balkans. And at the same time, that coincided with the coming to power of the AKP party in Turkey, 2002, 2003. So we saw a decrease in Saudi in, and Gulf interest and an increase in Turkish uh, interests and influence in the Balkans. So the Saudi uh, influence in, the, in Bosnia in particular did not disappear. Uh, it began slowly. So we saw, uh, uh, I, would, I would distinguish between for direct uh, foreign Salafi interests uh, influence in Bosnia and homegrown Salafism. So what we noticed over the last 15 years was um, a, a new brand of hybrid homegrown Salafism. Or so the, the guys who, who the people who converted to Salafism back in the 1990s were directly impacted by Saudi missionaries, Arab foreign fighters, or whoever else. Or, you know, the people who are converting to, Islam, to Salafism today are, are doing it because of their own free choice. They perhaps find some sort of stability uh, in, in, or uncertainty in these interpretations of Islam in, an, in a country which is undergoing, as Emily stated, different transitions, still from communism to liberal democracy, from war to peace, 
from uh, you know accessions to the European Union, this and that, and a lot of warmongering, daily warmongering uh, uh, from different nationalist circles. So people are still in search of stability and certainty, and apparently Salafism provides them certain uh, provides them this what they're looking for. So uh, so this is sort of a, I call it a hybrid. Salaf Salafism in Bosnia, where people, they're not really, it does a lot of cherry picking. People are not really sure what they want. They do not uh, exclusively focus on Salafi, uh, on Saudi Islamic scholars. They do a, a little bit, a bit of picking here and there. They, they, they might uh, recognize the authority of the Islamic community in Bosnia, but they will, they will still, you know, stick to certain opinions from the Saudi ulama, or they'll find another Salafi oriented scholar from Kuwait who might be more appealing to them. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot of cherry picking. Um, as far as Turkey is concerned, Turkey, of course, back in the 1990s, it was ruled by different coalitions of leftist, right with rightist, centrist uh, political parties. But after the coming to power of the AKP, we, we saw a, a reinvigorated Turkey that was that wanted to expand in its uh, former in the former Ottoman lands, just like Russia viewed uh, Central Asia Asia as its uh, near abroad. Likewise, Turkey views the Balkans. Parts of the Middle East and the Southern Caucasus as you know areas that where it wants to flex its muscles and increase its uh, cultural, economic, political, and religious influence. So we saw the Turks jump in and say, "Hey, you have a lot of destroyed mosques. We'll be we will be willing to re to reconstruct them. Do you want us to do so?" And the Bosnian government said, "Yes. Why not? You know." So what 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 differentiates the Turks from the Saudis is that is that the Turks came in and reconstructed most of these mosques and Islamic and madrasas that were built during the Ottoman Empire exactly as they were built back then. The Saudis would come and, you know, paint it all white. The, the Saudis don't like to have any frescoes, any, you know, calligraphy or this or flowers or designs. And they like their mosques to be straight for, you know, uh, white, white, basically. They like the mosques white without any decorations. The Turks are a bit more different. And of course, the Turks found common language with Bosnian Muslims in the sense that they say, you know, Bosnian Muslims accepted Islam during the, uh, under the Ottoman Empire. We have we have a uh, Bosnians belong to the Ottoman Islamic cultural zone. We have a lot a lot in common. We have our shared Sufi uh, heritage. We um, we'll, we celebrate together the Mevlid, the, the Prophet Muhammad's birthday. The Saudis don't; they don't like it. So we know we have more in common with you than the Saudis have with you. So we saw this increased Turkish influence, and of course, of course. Um, uh, uh, Turkey began, uh, you know, providing scholarships to Bosnian uh, Muslims, but unlike the Saudis, uh, who only provided scholarships for Islamic studies, the, the Turks offered scholarships for other, for social sciences, for engineering, for, uh, you know, whatever you want, and, uh, uh, along with theology as well. So Bosnian Muslims found Turkey far more acceptable and far closer to home compared to the to Gulf Arab states. And Iran, uh, we saw a complete decrease and a loss uh, in uh, in Iranian uh, actually political interest in, in the in the country, they still they still maintain some sort of uh, cultural influence here. There um, there are some similar uh, uh, points that 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 the dots that join Bosnian Muslims with uh, with Iran, and specifically, I mean, uh, what I referred to uh, neo neo Sufi, you know, um, Islamic mysticism. And, uh, and Sufi traditions, which are celebrated both in the Balkans and in Iran. But mostly the Islamic, the Iranian influence in Bosnia has been revolving around the cultural sphere. So they have about, uh, they had they opened up a non-governmental or organization called the Mullah Sadr Foundation, which translates uh, books about, about Shia Islam from Persian to Bosnian, about Islamic philosophy, Islamic mysticism, uh, Sufi poetry. Uh, you know, works by Jalaluddin Rumi and so on and so forth into Bosnian. Then there's also the Ibn Sina Institute functioning in Bosnia, which also does the same thing. There's a lot, a lot of cultural exchange. So they try to bring students to, to study Persian language in Bosnia for trips to Tehran uh, and, so, and so on and so forth. They, and they also opened up, they have a, a high school in, in, in Bosnia near Sarajevo. It's called the Persian, Persian Bosnian High School, uh, which is sort of an uh, elitist High school, uh, it's it's profit oriented. Uh, it has um, it, it does place a bit more focused on uh, on on promoting Iran. You know, they they celebrate the Iranian revolution every day. You know, Shia interpretations of Islam. They take their kids to an excursion to to Tehran every year. Uh, so that's about it. Uh, but there is no political influence. There is no military influence. There's hardly any economic cooperation um, between Bosnia and Iran. But anyway, this this religious cultural sphere is the sphere between. Uh, it, this Iranian uh, religious and cultural interest and influence, it's, it's interesting to, to follow in Bosnia. Uh, but I would say of all these three 
foreign factors that Turkey, the Turkish interpretation of Islam and Turkey as a country is perhaps among all other Muslim countries, the most dominant in Bosnia and in the Balkans today. Great, thanks so much, uh, Harun. Um, covered a lot of territory there. Um, em Emily, over, over to you. Ah, so thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, so I have this book coming out in September um, called Muslims in the Making of Modern Europe, which does indeed confront sort of conventional wisdom that Muslims are outsiders or foreigners or others to Europe. And it uh, takes us, it, it focuses predominantly on the areas that would become part of Yugoslavia, including Bosnia, Herzegovina, but also areas today that are part of Serbia, especially Southern Serbia, known as the Sanjak, Montenegro, North Macedonia, Kosovo, and sort of looks at the ways that Muslims were integrated into sort of modernizing European states from the outset. Um, when these territories were uh, absorbed by new states or conquered, as many Muslims at the time experienced it, um, they Muslims were given the choice of citizenship or you know, expulsion or to leave. Um, and citizenship came with all of the same rights um, as citizen other citizens. Um, and it also came with all of the same obligations, which could be expressed <coughs> as discrimination and repression because it required sort of an overhaul of existing Islamic cultures. Um, and what I try to, to do in this book is make sense of what sort of modern European state building looked like from the perspective of Muslims and how sort of Islamic traditions, cultures, and sort of laws became absorbed into European states. So the reciprocal relationship. Um, and within that, I, and I argue, and I think we see the same thing today, um, that, you know, Bosnian Muslims were always in a, in a position sort of between two separate kinds of push and pull influences, one coming from its north, right, which I think we could properly call Christian Europe, because that's how it was defining itself in these moments, and it was defining itself sort of vis-a-vis -vis or anti its marginalized minority communities, I mean, Muslims, Jews, Roma, they were seen as the outsiders, um, although most European states don't like to say that they were Christian, they like to see themselves as secular, which I think is a myth. Um, and then Bosnian Muslims also are being pulled at by sort of Turkey, the former Ottoman Empire, or you know, in the early 20th century, the Ottoman Empire still exists. And then sort of the broader, um, you know, a global Muslim community. I mean, that, that's sort of a little bit of a, of a red herring because it's there's a lot of complex communities that are involved. But so then you also have right in you know students in 1920s and 1930s you know Muslim students from Yugoslavia going to study in Egypt or going to study in Algeria um, or going to study in Istanbul and so you end up with these kind of complex sort of um, influences and uh, and tensions um, that would then also sort of play out within Bosnian Muslim cultures and, and communities themselves. And so you get, you know, rifts at different points in history where some Muslims really feel strongly that they should follow one path and others felt really strongly that they should follow a different path. And those paths can often be religious, but they can also be political, cultural, social economic. Right? And so if we sort of take that and we look at the contemporary period, we see lots of the same things going on. Right? The EU is not offering Bosnia a great economic deal. Right? It's been exploitative and imperialist since the end of the war. And I'm sorry if that offends anyone. Um, but there's, you know, a on the other hand, you've got lots of different countries in the Middle East, including Saudi Arabia, that are offering a different economic path mm -hmm. forward. And, um, and so, you know, there's this constant push and pull. It's uh, the Balkans are sort of, you know, they often get called the bridge or the in-between, right? I hate the idea that they're between East and West because I don't think that that dichotomy exists in that way. Um, but they are sort of a central node in a, in a really important geopolitical and economic network. Emily, if I may add something. Mm -hmm. Go yeah. ahead. Um, what I noticed is that, uh, Peter, can I? Please, yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, what I noticed is that back in the 19th century, in uh, early well, yeah, 19th century, um, most Bosnian Balkan Muslims would go to study in Istanbul to gain Islamic, you know, to seek Islamic knowledge in Istanbul. Then in the early 19th, uh, 20th century, they would slowly start turn toward this, they began turning towards Cairo and studying in Al Azhar. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, uh, after the, the Young Turk Revolution and the, the abolishment of the Caliphate in Turkey, they completely stopped going and studying. Uh, in Istanbul, so they focused more on Cairo. 
and then uh, Egypt. And then um, in the 1950s and 60s, when Yugoslavia was, became a part of the non-aligned movement and Josip Broz Tito, the then Yugoslav uh, president, strongman, dictator, had close contacts with, uh, with uh, Egypt and, and Iraq, uh, Yugoslav Muslims began studying, um, uh, continued studying in, in Egypt, but also began studying in Baghdad and uh, in Libya, because they also had Tito had close relations with uh, with uh, Muammar Gaddafi. So in the sixties, they began studying in Tripoli, uh, and then uh, this this trend continued until the eighties and and uh, until the nineteen eighties. So after the, the collapse of communism, uh, Bosnia Muslims pretty much stopped studying uh, in Tripoli, in Libya, and in Baghdad. But then reoriented themselves towards Saudi Arabia, um, uh, the Emirates, uh, mm -hmm. Kuwait. Pakistan, Malaysia, there was at least 300 Bosnian Muslim students studying in Malaysia, Morocco, and so on and so forth. This is a really interesting point to note. And I just want to add to that, and in the, the question of soft power, right, we often think of the non-alignment period and the socialist era as distinct, but in 1980, and not, like from 1980 to 1986, there's all sorts of wonderful secret police reports in the Yugoslav secret police archive about how, um, uh, Omar Gaddafi and Saddam Hussein and the Ayatollah Khomeini are trying to fund like the mosque in Zagreb or fund different projects and they were trying right. to utilize their political influence within this sort of Yugoslav non-aligned movement to also sort of kind of reintroduce um, their own influence within Islam um, and so there's this kind of fascinating um story within the late socialist period where some of these influences were kind of re-emerging. Yeah, so so much here. I mean, the, the, the book that is yet to be written about kind of Libyan internationalism under Gaddafi is just gonna be fascinating, absolutely. Okay, so, so here, here's our dilemma. We have, we've had like 23 questions in the, in the, <laughs> the chat. We've got about eight minutes left. Um, thankfully, in your responses, both of you have already touched on aspects of some of the questions. Questions about, for example, whether and how mosque design began to change in Bosnia after Saudi religious influence, um, how we should think about kind of dynamics of competition between Turkish religious influences and Gulf religious influences to today. So let me go to a couple of questions that, that you haven't touched on uh, yet. What one for each of you? Um, this, this question comes from Amir Telebesarovic, and my apologies if I pronounced that incorrectly, who asks, what about fighters who came to join Bosnian resistance army independently without Saudi intermediation, including even a few from Afghanistan? Um, Amir mentions that he was in the Bosnian army during the siege of Sarajevo and didn't see any of those people on the front line, but heard that there had been fighters who came in without help or support of the Saudi government in other parts of Bosnia. Haroon, do we know what happened to them after the war, the, 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 those yeah. who survived? Um, well, okay. first of all, it was for, uh, Sarajevo was under siege. So uh, the person asking, posing this question could have not really come across any foreign fighters in Sarajevo, the capital city of Bosnia, because the city was under siege. You couldn't really enter or exit the capital. So they're mostly, they, they were mostly located around the, the central Bosnian towns of Visoko, Zenica, uh, perhaps Kakanya, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, uh, they did not, uh, well, they were Salafi oriented fighters, but they came pretty much by themselves individually from uh, most of them, some of them were, or most of them were actually former Afghan veterans of the Afghan war. So they came by themselves from Pakistan across Istanbul to, or across Vienna to Sarajevo. Um, they did not, they were not really funded by the Saudi, the Saudi uh, government per se. Um, some of them came directly from the, from Saudi Arabia, from Egypt, from Kuwait. Uh, so they fought in Bosnia during the war. They stayed in Bosnia until 2001. And after 2000, after the September 11th attacks, the U.S. government placed, uh, a lot of pressure on the Bosnian government to expel. Actually, there were two. There were two waves of expulsions. First, in 1996, as soon as the Dayton Peace Accords were signed in the U U.S., the U.S. forced Bosnia uh, to uh, uh, to expel its foreign fighters, and especially to shut down an alleged Iranian training facility in the country. The U.S. was much more interested in, in kicking out the Iranians than in kicking out uh, former Afghan fighters, because we, as we know, back then the CIA had been fighting funding these. Afghan fighters during the Soviet invasion of uh, Afghanistan. So these those fighters, they did remain in Bosnia. They mostly continued living in two very secluded Salafi villages, Bochnia and Gornia Maucha. Uh, Emily might know <laughs> more about this. Um, so they couldn't continue living in these two small villages, living very 
a very austere religious pious uh, life and of course uh, you know disseminating their teachings among the local uh, Bosnian Muslim population. Uh, a lot of pressure was placed on them after the 9-11 attacks by the Bosnian and the US government. So the Bosnian government mostly expelled them out of the country. In fact, it revoked their Bosnian citizenships, which were gained through marriage with local Bosnian Muslim women or you know, through passage of time, revoked their citizenships and expelled them back to, the, to their home country. Some of them, I believe they faced the death penalty when they returned to Egypt, Algeria, and Iraq because under those, you know, the, the local criminal codes of these countries it was a it was a well fighting for a foreign army was punishable by death so some of them as far as i remember they faced the death penalty uh, i don't really know if they were executed or not others some were jailed others decided to to join a new new war zones i i know that some of them uh went back to afghanistan some of them went uh, maybe to i don't know they decided to join other other war zones around around the world. So uh, as far as I know, perhaps only a, a handful of them remain, perhaps five or six of them remain in Bosnia. As Emily just mentioned, uh, there's an excellent book about these foreign fighters written by Daryl Lee. It came out, I think last year. Uh, I think it's called, uh, I'm really not sure what it's called, Made the Landscapes of Jihad or... Um... Empire and Jihad? Uh, Empire, is it called? The, no, it's called it's the, universal, the Universal the, Enemy. Universal Enemy, right. Jihad Empire and the Challenges of Solidarity. This was a, a, a actually, yeah, Daryl has done an excellent research. He has been doing a years, year long research in Bosnia, interviewing many of these former fighters. So this, it's, an, it's a book that covers the entire story from A to Z. Great, great, thanks, Harun. So this next question, uh, I think is one that's looking for the assessment of a professional historian. So Emily, I'm gonna put this one to you. This is from Nicholas Reachmack who says Ivo Andrić's book, Bridge on the Drina, implied general harmony among the cultures inhabiting Sarajevo. Was this truly representative of the pre-World War II era, or was he looking through rose-colored glasses as he wrote this most interesting chronology? Um, well, I will say that there's significant parts of that book that are sort of racist toward Muslims. Um, and when we read that text, we need to reflect on its sort of moment of production uh, and, and it, it was a product of its time. Um, but, you know, in, in the Ottoman period and into the Habsburg period and the early Yugoslav period, um, it it's not that communities were, um, you know, there, it's not that everybody was living you know, always peacefully together and loving each other all of the time. I mean, that kind of sort of idyllic multiculturalism is um, is a is a flawed paradigm. Um, but there were people did live together, and and the ways that that happened um, were changing. Right within the Ottoman period, people had distinct socio confessional legal structures. Um, the communities were largely segregated in their private lives, whereas public spaces were integrated. Um, the Ottomans introduced mandatory representation from every community, every community of faith in the late 19th century in certain cities, and that tradition would continue on. Um, one of my sort of favorite set of documents was from the town of Novi Pazar in 1919, where they're desperately trying to find a Jew to serve on every committee because there's only four or five people, Jewish citizens who were sort of eligible for these different things, but every committee needed to have a member of every single faith because that was the tradition of representation. And, and so there were sort of, there was a dialogue and there was a method, a political method, a social method, a legal method. The era of nationalization um, changes that. And the imposition of a single model of law, culture, society, right, in whichever direction it's trying to go, um, whether it's Yugoslav, whether it's you know, the Kingdom of Serbia, whether it's sort of an Austro-Hungarian nationalization campaign, um, those, those sort of change the ways that different communities interacted and related and also the power they had within the communities to sort of mediate local situations. Okay, great, thank you. I am, in the interest of time, I'm gonna kind of throw out a collection of, of questions um, and then just invite both of you to respond to any or any parts of them that you would like. Um, and I'm, my apologies in advance to those of you whose questions we're not gonna get to. We will make sure that our speakers do, do see them all though. Um, here's one from Phil Fernandez who kind of observes that we're obviously talking primarily about 
uh, transnational influences going into Bosnia and the Balkans. And so he is asking an interesting question about whether there's a two-way dimension here. Um, have Saudi Arabia, Iran, or Turkey welcomed Bosnians into their countries and cultures? And if so, have they had any cultural or religious in influence? Just, just anecdotally, I was doing some research on kind of international Islamic higher education Ooh, 15 years ago or so now. And while visiting the International Islamic University in Islamabad, Pakistan, I found a community of Bosnian students who had come to Pakistan as evacuees from the war when they were very young, had stayed in pa Pakistan, and had certainly clearly established themselves as kind of student leaders within the International Islamic University in Islamabad. And so question there about kind of um, the, the differential vectors of transnationalism. Um, another one from Clifford Bond, who says, could your speakers address the democratic nature of Bosnia's formal Islamic community? and the election of its leader, the uh, uh, Reis or Grand Mufti. Also please address the efforts of the formal traditional community uh, to contain what is kind of perceived or viewed as ex extremism. And then finally, uh, Walter Grazer asks a very interesting question about the extent to which, if any, Salafi Islam has had on the relations of Bosnian Muslims uh, with um, uh, particularly Christian communities in Bosnia, Roman Catholics or Orthodox uh, Christians. So let me pose those, that, that kind of cluster of questions to um, both of you. Um, Harun, can we start with you? Yeah, um, I'm not really sure to what extent it was a two-way, we can talk about a two-way influence. I mean, yes, the person you're talking about in Islamabad is, uh, I believe one of them is, is the Bosnian Muslim who became a professor at the International Islamic University in Islamabad. I think he went there to study, but he remained, he continued his master's and PhD uh, thesis and remained uh, teaching there. There's also, there are similar examples with Bosnian Muslims who went to study in Malaysia, the International Islamic University in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, one of them also stayed there uh, teaching, I think, Islamic architecture. Um, as for Saudi Arabia, I'm not really sure. Uh, there are some who have, who have remained there, although I'm not sure if they teach at any university. As, as you know, in Saudi Arabia, it's for a foreigner to teach at the Saudi government university it's quite tough to get a to get a teaching post so i'm not sure any bosnian would would is able to reach that far um, um but uh, uh, there are there's a sizable uh, bosnian muslim population in turkey um dating back to the to the um, pull out of the ottomans in in 1878 and the annexation of bosnia by the austro-hungarian and the successive waves of bosnian of, of expulsions of Balkan Muslims, you know, from uh, from uh, from Bosnia, from San the Sanjak region of Serbia, and then also voluntary uh, voluntary, uh, you know, uh, how shall I say this? Yeah, the people who decided to voluntarily leave Yugoslavia in, during the during the communist repression in the 1960s and who have settled in uh, Yugoslavia. This these are very tiny, uh, small examples and tiny populations of 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 Bosnians who have gone abroad. Um, and I do not believe that they can really be compared to the amount and the extent of foreign influence that we see um, uh, in, in, in Bosnia and in the Balkans today. Um, perhaps Emily can answer the second question, so I'll, I'll come back to the third one about how the Bosnian, the Islamic community reacted to foreign influences and, uh, and how uh, what, what the Salafism impacted uh, Bosnian Muslim relations with Catholics uh, and Orthodox Christians. You want or? You know, I'm forgetting what the second question was. <laughs> I, I did not write it down. Um, is I, that? But it, I it would. Was, so it, it would, the second the second question was: Could your speakers please address the democratic nature of Bosnia's former Islamic community, election of the Grand Mufti, and efforts by that um, that that community, the kind of quote unquote traditionalist community, to contain what's often perceived as extremist influences? Mm -hmm. Um. I'd actually prefer to answer the third question since we're, we're low on time and I, I have something to say about that. Sure, Which, go ahead. Um, that, you know, the, in terms of the ways that Salafism is it, um, affecting local relations, uh, I have an anecdote, right? I, there was this one moment where I was traveling with a Muslim friend. We were going to another archive in a different city and um, we were trying to figure something out. And we stopped a police officer and he said, you know, Salam Aleichem. And, Immediately, this police officer said, you can't say that. That is, you know, that is Islamic and this is a Bosnian culture and we, you know, we are Bosnians and you're imposing. I mean, he started going off on us. And then as we were leaving, he says, Bulk, right, which is the Croat term for God. 
And it was a sort of new hello, goodbye, ciao that emerged in terms of like, that, that actually means God, right? So God be with you. And there's this moment where we have this sense that anything Islamic, right, is perceived as somehow foreign, right? And that kind of plays back on the idea that Muslims themselves are foreign. Whereas other cultures, right, are allowed to experience religiosity in dynamic ways, including in the imposition of language um, that is, is held to a totally different standard. Um, and I think that um, oftentimes the Saudi influence, and especially when you see sort of Saudi um, kind of, uh, or Salafist, uh, you know, the end of alcohol in certain areas or certain kinds of non-traditional dress that's emerged in Bosnia, or there's a suburb outside of Sarajevo that's known as like the Saudi suburb. Um, when you see that, I think oftentimes Croats and Serbs use that as a way to say, aha, you see, you know, Muslims are foreign Muslims, right? It's Islam that's foreign. It's Islam that is from the outside. Um, and I think that that's challenging and problematic um, because it prevents a real understanding of the local history and the, and the regional expertise. Great. Thanks, Emily. And, and insofar as there are shades in your response, there are themes that you do with in the forthcoming book. I just wanted to make sure that our audience knows that I've put a link up to your forthcoming book in the in the chat box. Um, so, you so, so you know, of course, and Haroon, why don't we turn to you for the final word? We're, we're a few minutes over, but thankfully, uh, Ruth yeah. Gope and our um, events coordinator has given us permission to run a bit over. So please. Go, yeah, well, go as Emily said, I mean, there's a lot of Islamophobia coming from Serbian and Croatian nationalistic circles when reporting on, especially in their media, when we reporting uh, on Islam and on Bosnian Muslims, any, uh, they, they tend to correlate, they tend to make a, a, a well, to, to, to claim that there's a correlation between Islamic revival and Islamic extremism. So every sign of an Islamic revival among Bosnian Muslims is a sign of Islamic extremism. If, if they see a, a, you know, a girl or a woman wearing a headscarf or a new mosque being constructed, they immediately claim that this, these are signs of Bosnian Muslims turning to extremism. Uh, in fact, a couple of uh, five or six years ago, when Bosnia became a hot destination for Gulf, rich Gulf tourists, um, uh, uh, neighboring Serbia and Croatia were so jealous that they began claiming that uh, that Bosnia be was becoming a, 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 an ISIL hotbed, and that these tourists were somehow promoting tourists were somehow promoting extreme interpretations of Islam. And I'm really not sure uh, how many tourists will have you will have the time. To you know, uh, or, uh, when they not, we're not sight, we're not sightseeing or shopping to go around and promoting Salafi interpretations of Islam among the Bosnian Muslim population, but apparently that that's what the, this media claimed. Um, uh, but as far as what I wanted to, to, to mention was that uh, to, to the question posed earlier, um, the Islamic community in Bosnia it is very democratic. It's quite different compared to other Islamic communities in the Muslim world in the sense that it is very autonomous. It selects its own. Uh, muf muftis, it selects, it appoints its own uh, imams or religious leaders, and all these people, there's, a, there's sort of a, a mini parliament, um, uh, which is run by the, the, the Islamic community, has its own mini parliament, which elects uh, the, its own grand mufti uh, for a mandate of uh, seven, uh, seven years. So it is, it is very, uh, uh, so it's very autonomous, it's self-funded, and it has been seen as, as uh, a beacon of moderate Islam among in the Balkans. It has um, it accepts the secular nature of the of the state. It never questions the secular laws. It has never asked for the recognition of Sharia marriages. Sharia marriages are not recognized in Bosnia, uh, so it in fact insists on Bosnian Muslims conducting civil marriages. Um, it, it has never called for the introduction of Islamic law. It has never even called for the. Uh, it, it hardly even even fights for Muslim women to to have the right to wear the headscarf. You know, every time every time there's a case where a Muslim woman is banned from entering the the local court, the Islamic community hardly ever reacts because they say, "Well, these are the laws of the state. We must respect the secular laws of the state." So, uh, <laughs> in this sense, it is very very particular, and it has been doing a great job in in uh, combating extremism, especially since uh, 2016, and uh, when we saw a small number of. Uh, ISIL fighters uh, of Balkan Muslims joining the ranks of ISIL in Syria and Iraq. Again, these were very tiny numbers, but they were vastly exaggerated by, by, by neighboring Serbia and Croatia. This is still pretty much an ongoing war between these two neighboring country, countries and Bosnia. A war, it's, it's, it's a frozen conflict which is now being fought through the media and through accusations that Bosnia is a hotbed of Islamic extremism. Uh, but uh, historians such as Emily uh, who have been studying uh, Bosnian Muslims for quite some time, I believe they have, they know better. Great. 
Well, um, unfortunately, we have reached the end of our time today. Um, I want to first and foremost thank Professor Grebel and Dr. Karsich for their remarks and for prompting, as you can see, an incredibly rich and wide ranging discussion. There are plenty more questions that we could have gotten through. Um, a reminder to all of you joining us today that the the short documentary film that is sort of the prompting impetus for this session um, is, is, is available to you on uh, YouTube. Um, it's only about 12 minutes long, um, but uh, Haroon manages to pack an incredibly uh, rich discussion and portrait um, of these dynamics and developments into that short period of time. And if the short film and our discussion leave you wanting more, you may be in luck because we're actually in talking with Haroon um, about the possibility of producing already two more sequel uh, documentaries that will explore respectively Turkish and Iranian influence on religion in Bosnia. So stay tuned for more information on those as the summer rolls on. My thanks as ever to Ruth Gopin who coordinates all our events here at the Berkeley Center and all the rest of the center staff for making these sessions possible. And finally, let me thank all of you for joining us today. Take care and we hope to see you at another Berkeley Center event soon. Bye-bye everyone.